stuff. Welcome to Newport Mesa Church. Why don't we just give it up for all of our first time guests today. Um, we don't get to welcome recent Marine graduates every week, but this week we do. I want to just say what's up to Torsten, Andy, I think you guys are here. Let's just give it up for them. I saw you guys in the back. Awesome. Welcome home, you guys. Welcome home. It's also good to see some newlyweds are back from Mexico. Isn't the married life amazing? Yeah. Love seeing Gavin McKenna. Hey, today, uh, by the way, my name's Jordan. Uh, we, I serve here as lead pastor. We're just so grateful for you. Glenn hit it right on the head. The 23andMe test, the ancestry test is right. We're all family. Can I get an amen? I, like, not just biologically, because we do all go back to Adam and Eve, but God has made us one big spiritual family. It's awesome. And uh, if you're tuning in on Facebook, I just want you to know, I want any guest to know that is here today, our hope is that you grow with Jesus. That's what our community is all about. We want to be a part of the process of what you growing with Jesus looks like. It's a process, but there's also these moments um, uh, in our life that God does big stuff. And it, it, sometimes they're moments, and sometimes they happen through relationships and events, and it's all good. And uh, our hope is that you grow with Jesus. Today, I want to do something that we also don't get to do every week. I want to honor someone who has been leading someone who's totally sold out and committed to helping people grow with Jesus. He's been doing that for his whole career, much of his life. Um, I, I'm pretty sure it might be a, a record even in the United States. I don't know. He's the longest standing uh, group leader uh, in our church. He's led uh, his group for 37 years. I want to honor Keith and Mert uh, this morning as they come down. Let's just give it for Keith and Mert Ewing. I have a small gift for them, but I want to, 37 years of impacting people's lives. Just in that group, Mert has told me that, um, that besides about four years in your 50 plus marriage that you've led groups, young adults, youth, whatnot, and your hope is um, that, that people meet Jesus and grow with him. I just did a, a few, a little, some numbers crunching, just to kind of just try to wrap our minds around what... 37 years looks like, uh, and you know, it, it, it's always fun to think about these things, 37 years, now again, more years leading groups, this is just the one single group that, that, that Keith and Mert have led, uh, okay, so 37 years equates into 1,920 group sessions, plus or minus, okay, plus or minus, so almost 20,000 Sundays, sorry, 20 Almost 2,000 Sundays. I, I'm a language person, not a math person, but I still like to play with math. Uh, so 2,000 group sessions, and uh, I, I just did a little computing. If, if, if you put about five hours a week into the lesson, and, and you know, I'm sure some, day, some weeks would be more, some would be less, but let's just say on average, that comes out to, are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Uh, 4.5. 625 years of full-time work, 40 hours a week. So close to five years, uh, what an offering. Now, what was the pay like, Keith? Was it, was it good? <laughs> oh, Mert pays him, she says. Okay, he says. So behind every great woman, there's a great man. And that's how it's worked with you guys. Let's just give it up for Keith and Mert one more time. We're, we're going to set the record for how many times we can give them rounds of applause. Um, I, I just did one more thing mathematically, just because I was curious, what, what the value of those 4.625 years would be of volunteering all, all that time, 40 hours a week for that plus over the course of all those years. And again, that was just the 37-year class. You know, more than that is, is obviously included in your ministry in the college and beyond. Um, but what would that look like in terms of your volunteerism? And the, this does not factor into inflation. It also doesn't factor into uh, graduating pay scales. But I, I calculated it. It's about almost $350,000 worth of your time you gave to all those people that, 
that, that uh, and, and so we just wanted to honor you with a gift card, and I can promise you that this gift card is not worth $350,000. <laughs> However, uh, we don't do ministry for extrinsic, in, uh, extrinsic rewards, and uh, Keith and Mert, I know that you haven't been doing this for financial reward. You've done this to see lives change. And uh, we, as the body of Christ, want to just say, well done. Keith is going to be transitioning and retiring uh, so that he can pursue some of his artistic uh, focuses in this stage of his life. And, uh, and I'm just thinking about the question, who's going to rise up and, and take, not that you could ever take uh, Keith's place, but there are groups that need to be led. <laughs> and he's looking for you. And, and maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today, that God wants you to be a shepherd of people and to lead a, a group as faithfully as this amazing couple has. Let's just give them one huge round of applause one more time. We're grateful for you. Newport Mesa Church says thank you, and Jesus sees it. We're so grateful for you. It, uh, it was one of the greatest pleasures of my life to help officiate a wedding with Keith, and that's when I first realized, wow, what a, a gentleman scholar he is. Just so gracious and so loving, and and uh, just a great couple. Our church is full of people, hopefully, uh, that are just as committed as, as Keith and Mert. Our hope is that, that you'll grow with Jesus with us. That's really, when it comes down to it, that's it. Uh, just so thankful for, th- for them. We're in a series called Thanks Living. Turn to your neighbor and say, Thanks Living. Thanks Living. It is uh, the season of the turkey, and I know that, you know, for one day out of the year, we're supposed to be thankful, right? And uh, we're, we're really looking at what does a lifestyle of giving thanks look like? And we're trying to process that question, how do I grow in gratitude? In fact, the sermon uh, insert, there's a message insert in your bulletin. You can go to the bottom. There's five questions. You can go out to lunch today and talk about the message with your spouse or with your roommate or with someone over dinner this week. Maybe you and the Holy Spirit can have a conversation as uh, as you really think about the application of this truth in your life. How do we grow in gratitude? And today we're looking at the eternal perspective. Turn to your neighbor and say, flip the script. Flip the script. That's our hope, that you will make a decision today to flip the script. To flip the script. Giving thanks is a discipline that will change the way our brains work because it forces us to think about the good. I love it when science backs up what we already know to be true in scripture and um, there's all sorts of articles out there that will uh, show you studies that indicate your neural pathways can be rewired through gratitude and through thanksgiving that the way that your brain actually works can be renewed isn't it crazy romans 12 2 it's actually true god can transform the way you think and when your thinking is transformed it tra- changes the way you act and the way you speak and the way the way you relate to people We talked about a lot of the benefits last week. Um, There are just so many benefits, but sometimes we're not focused in the right area, are we? Sometimes we totally just miss it. We don't realize how much God has blessed us and what it is that he could be doing in the midst of our reality. I want to show you what I mean um, with just a simple interactive thing. I, I want you to look at the person next to you, and I want you to focus on anything blue. All right, so look at the person next to you. Look at the person behind you. Look at the person in front of you. Because in a moment, I'm going to ask you to recall what items, who are they. Uh, I want you to be able to know the names of people who are wearing blue, okay? So whoever's wearing blue, focus on the blue. All right. (laughs) Todd's got a big old blue shirt up here on the front, front row. Come on, blue shoes. Blue, blue, blue. Okay, everyone, close your eyes. Everyone, everyone, close your eyes. If you're looking at me, I'm going to call you out. I'm just giving you for a warning. Everyone, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. I won't call you out if you close your eyes, so close your eyes. All right, now I want you to think of the names of the people wearing red. Okay, open your eyes. I tricked you. Now, some of you with really good memories, right, you probably actually just have a photographic memory, so you remember all the red, but because you were so focused on the blue, you never looked at people with red clothes. Sometimes we are like that in life. 
We're so focused on one thing that we actually miss what is right underneath our nose. We don't see it. And because we don't see it, we can't give thanks for it because we don't even recognize that it's there. And I want to really just kind of dig into that this morning. I want to help us flip the script today. Instead of focusing on the bad, to focus on the good. Now, here's the thing. Anyone, regardless of your religious or spiritual affiliation, can practice this, but the deepest application of it is going to be true uh, in, in, in ways that bring even a deeper sense of peace, especially in the midst of suffering and chaos, than if it weren't. So if you're a Christian today, the good news is we're going to go uh, into, into a truth that's a little weightier. It's not heavy, it's weighty, but, uh, but because of God's power, um, there is a possibility for you to experience peace even in the midst of some really horrendous, horrendous things. And if you don't know Christ, my prayer is that today you will open up your heart to him because God wants to come in to, to the place where it is that you're suffering and experiencing hardship and, and, and be with you there. Um, I, I realize that not everyone could technically categorize themselves as a positive person. Uh, you know, I, we call them optimists. Um, and, and not everyone, likewise, would be able to categorize themselves as a pessimist. In fact, most of us are somewhere in the middle. Sometimes we're posit positive, sometimes we're negative. Sometimes we focus on fear, sometimes we're full of faith, and we can run circles around anyone. And so it just depends on the area. But I, I do think that all of us have experiences where we've struggled. Uh, I heard a story this week about a dog, a very intelligent dog. I, I, I wish this story was autobiographical, but my golden doodle was not blessed with intelligence. This, this must have been a German shepherd, maybe, I don't know, a very intelligent dog, uh, maybe a poodle. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of breeds out there. I don't know exactly what kind of dog it was. I just know it was really smart. And it liked meat. So it showed up to a butcher's house one day. Uh, his shop. And in this dog's mouth was a purse. The dog walked through the front door, which was propped open by a brick, and sat down in front of the butcher and the purse fell out of its mouth, and the dog barked. Woof! Okay, so the butcher was kind of like shocked. Like, here this dog is, what looks to be a purse in front of him. As he reaches down, the dog doesn't do anything, and he grabs the purse, and he asks the dog, as if the dog could answer him, what do you want? Do you want meat? The dog barked. Woof! He said, well, I've never seen a a dog that understood my questions, what kind of meat do you want? Do you want bacon? Do you want hamburger? Do you want pork? Do you want steak? Oof, you know, another bark. He's like, this dog has good taste. You know, he likes steak. So, okay, I'm going to go over the options. We've got flank steak. We've got uh, New York strip. We've got ribeye. Oof, ribeye. Okay, you have really good steak. Come on, somebody. I mean, ribeye. The dog has good taste. And, and the dog is sitting there interacting with this butcher. This butcher is thinking, this is insane. My wife is never going to believe me. He said, well, how many pounds of ribeye do you want? Do you want a half a pound? Do you want a pound? Do you want a pound and a half? Do you want two pounds? Oof! Two pounds. You want two pounds. Well, two pounds is going to be equal to... Let me just see what you have in your purse. So he opens up this little wallet, this little purse, and discovers there is the exact amount that this dog needs for two pounds of ribeye steak. Again, this is not my golden doodle, okay? So, not my life. And, and this butcher is just thinking, I just can't believe this. So, he, I have to figure out where this dog comes from, what kind of home this dog comes from. So, he lets the dog go, and he follows the dog at a, a little bit of a distance, and he goes a couple blocks, and the dog goes up the stairs, and he goes up the stairs, and he's kind of hiding behind the, uh, the corner. As he's looking around the corner, he sees the dog reach up, and he starts to paw on the door, and bark and paw on the door and all of a sudden the door swings open and the owner just rips into this intelligent animal you dumb dog I can't believe it I can't believe it you dumb dog just you know add all of the colorful language you would like to the butcher 
jumps out from behind the corner and says, whoa, wait, 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 wait. I have never seen such an intelligent animal. I cannot believe that this animal is so intelligent. I've never had this interaction with the animal. And the guy just looks at the butcher and says this. Yeah, but this is the third time this week he's forgotten his keys. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to insert more dad jokes into the messages. So, you know, if you're not laughing, just, you know. And sometimes we don't, we just don't see what's right in front of us. And we're not grateful or have a grateful attitude about something that is true true of our lives because we're so focused on the negative. Garrison Keillor has <laughs> some amazing stories about Aunt Gertrude who just couldn't help herself but terrorize her guests about the things that her guests weren't saying. And the reality is all of us uh, at times in our life have been too focused on the bad. So what would it look like to be focused on the good? My belief is that if we can focus on the good in any situation, it gives us the ability to be thankful even when we're walking through something tough. Turn to your neighbor and say, flip the script. Some of us have to flip the script. Let me give you, give you some examples. Now we're going to do a little reader response. So at the end of this, I want you to say, thank you, Jesus, okay? So this is a little back and forth. We're going to practice with the first one. Um, students, you might relate to this, you may not, this could be anyone, but I remember having this thought in junior high, I don't have a million friends, but the ones I have are there for me. All right, that was a little weak. You know, here's the thing, thank you Jesus is the punchline, so you got to come through, okay, so you're preaching this sermon. Here we go, we're going to do it again. I didn't get into the school of my dreams, but I did get into a great school. There's something there to be grateful for. I didn't get hired, but it gave me time to read the Bible and pray more. Thank you, Jesus. And yes, we all know that's true. If you've been recently laid off, I can only imagine that you're in Scripture 10 hours a day. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, people. Thank you, Jesus. Here we go. I don't have my dream job, but I am providing for my family. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I got laid off, but now my kids' friends believe my kids when they actually say they have a dad. It's funny, I actually heard that one last year. I, I had to chuckle. Um, I haven't been able to pay all my bills, but at least I'm not one of my creditors. Come on, I'm trying to help you. Thank you, Jesus needs to be the punchline, so come on, help me here. Um, I haven't gotten married yet, but I've traveled and seen the world and grown as a person. It didn't work out with that guy or girl, but now I have all this extra money. I'm not dating anyone, but I've, um, I have more time now to serve in areas that I'm passionate about. Uh, how about this one? My engagement ended, but I'm so grateful because my first fiancé turned out to be a psycho. Social media will help you realize that later. Um, that, that was not autobiography. Okay, here we go. My marriage didn't survive, but I was blessed with the best kids on the planet. My marriage is really struggling, but I'm really grateful for a spouse who hasn't given up. My wife is always right, but at least I'm really good at being wrong. I don't have the family I imagined, but I do have the family that I have been given. My one-year-old is waking up at 2 a.m., but he gives the best midnight snuggles. Confession, Tara gets the most of those. My three-year-old is extremely strong-willed, but God is showing me how he feels. Okay, there was a not very many thank you Jesuses on that one. I'm wondering if that hit a little too close to home for some of you. Uh, okay, I didn't have the greatest childhood, but I had the opportunity to get it right with my kids. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My daughter is getting married, and her in-laws are just so unkind but at least we'll be the favorite grandparents. <laughs> this is my favorite. I don't have, by the way, this is not true of me, but this is just my favorite. I don't have amazing relatives, like I don't have them, 
but at least I get to choose my friends. <laughs> the reality is the way that we view something can determine the blessing that we experience because if we don't recognize that even in some pretty tough situations there's good things to recognize, uh, then we'll miss out on a lot of what God is doing. Turn to your neighbor and say, flip the script. I think I realized this so uh, powerfully in a small group um, setting. We were, uh, we, we were doing a marriage group, and the speaker introduced his mom in such a way that I just have never been able to forget it. Um, he, he said this about his mom, and he, he, he categorized his mom as this optimist, this She's a thankful person, someone who is, is just has so much gratitude in her life. And she said, you can, you can never offend her. You can never say something that would disappoint her. She will, she will just choose to focus on the one good thing. She, he said, it, it, it's so bad. You can call her a week after her birthday, okay? You've forgotten her birthday. It's been a week. And you can call her and say, Mom, I'm so terribly sorry to tell you happy birthday. And she would literally respond, with, oh my goodness, I am so thankful you have given me reason to celebrate my birthday by seven days. Thank you. How many of you grew up with a mom like that? <laughs> or know someone like that? They're just perpetually grateful, thankful. Christina, I saw that hand. Um, and, and, and for those of us who would consider ourselves, we're not pessimists, but we're realists. We are grateful for those of you who see life like that, and we can learn something from you, my prayer is that we flip the script. But it goes deeper. You know, anybody can do that. You don't even have to believe in God to flip the script, to see the good in the situation, even though it says uh, in the New Testament that every good gift is from above, that everything that is good in our life is ultimately from God, even if we don't recognize that. But for a Christian today, it's especially powerful for people who have been blinded by circumstances that are very painful. Uh, memories that can be painful, memories that can hold us back. And, and so I want to go a little bit deeper today into a weightier truth because I believe that, uh, that anyone in this room from any perspective in life can not only see what good is potentially happening, but what God is doing. And when we begin to see what God could be up to in the midst of a painful situation, it, it just it gives us the umph to keep going. So the second question that I think we need to ask in situations you know, where we're trying to grow in gratitude and, and, and get better at giving thanks is to ask the question, not only how is it good, but how is God involved? I want you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22, verses 14. We're going to read all the way through 23. This uh, this is actually in one of the toughest uh, weeks of Jesus' life. I, I say tough because he's literally about to be crucified. He, he's about to be crucified for actions and thoughts and sins, or where we've missed the mark as humanity, none of which he actually participated. Right? He, he wasn't guilty himself. He was in a totally innocent man. Jesus lived a totally perfect life, but he paid for the sins of the world. So that, we're just moments away from that, but we're also moments away from all of his friends abandoning him and one of his friends betraying him. So talk about a bad day, bad season, a bad week, a bad moment. And yet in the midst of everything that's happening and the suffering he's about to face, he takes a moment to give thanks. I'm grateful for babies, just so you know. And that one is especially snuggly. Jenny, we love you. Let's read chapter, chapter 22, verse 14. And you can see it up on the screen uh, if you didn't bring your Bibles. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. See, Jesus knew that he was about to suffer. It wasn't something that he blindly went into. This was the mission by which God had called him to engage in on earth. From the moment he arrived, he knew what was ahead. The ups and downs and the ultimate act of dying on the cross. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, when he had given thanks, maybe you grew up as a Catholic and you heard of the term Eucharist. 
And that word actually comes from the Greek word that supplies us given thanks. Most Protestants call communion, or the Last Supper communion, it's just a moment, it's a ritual that Jesus infuses meaning into, uh, but his Jewish brothers would have understood it a little differently. So this would have been a very shocking thing to hear him say. So he gives thanks, it says in 17. Take this and to divide it amongst yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, again, Eucharisto, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The next verse goes on to say Jesus knows that Judas was with him. In other words, his best friend is at the table and he's giving thanks. Let's pray. Father, even in the midst of trying seasons, even in the midst of hardships, even in the midst of disappointment, even in the midst of cynicism, even in the midst of uh, all of the things that we could focus on, God, just help us see what Jesus did in the midst of a very, very difficult time. A moment where he suffered excruciatingly, Lord. Not just physically, but especially spiritually. Lord, help us to, to gain strength from what he did for us. Uh, help us to be grateful and thankful for salvation. God, it was because of Jesus that we can know you. It's because of Jesus that we can find freedom. It's because of Jesus that we can discover purpose. And it's only because of Jesus that we truly can, at the deepest level, make a difference in this world. So, Lord, I pray today, Lord, that you would feel our thankful hearts as we praise you, as we worship you, and as we learn more about how we can lean into what you're doing on this earth through us. In Jesus' name, amen. That second question is so critical. How is God involved? How is God involved? Jesus gives thanks. He gives thanks for the wine and the bread. These are both elements in the Passover meal. But again, he infuses new meaning into these four promises that the Jewish peoples have celebrated all the way back to the departure of Egypt, right? The promises of salvation, the promises of deliverance, the promises of redemption, the promise of praise or fulfillment. If you go all the way back to Exodus 6, these are the four I wills that God promises Israel through Moses. And in this moment, Jesus is saying, I am will deliver the I wills. Jesus is saying, I am the reason that these promises are going to be fulfilled. It's a powerful moment. It's a mo moment that I'm not sure the Jew, his Jewish disciples really under, quite understood, but for us today, we're grateful because if Jesus never would have went to the cross, we would be eternally alienated and separated from the Father. It was what Jesus was thankful for that allows us to come close to God because the, the wine represents the blood of the new covenant. The Matthew version of this story says, for the forgiveness of our sins. All of us have missed God in various ways. We've missed the mark, but Jesus hits the bullseye for us. We don't like to talk about blood very much, but Jesus literally bled his life out so that we would never have to bleed our life out. The natural consequence of sin or missing the mark is to experience the consequences of those actions and those thoughts. And if Jesus never would have went to the cross, we would be rightly accused of all of the things that we have done to miss the mark. The second thing he thanks God for is for the bread, which represents his body, which he says was given for you. What I, what I find so it's not surprising, it's just hard for my mind to fully wrap around, is that Jesus, knowing everything that he was about to face, was not a coward. He didn't back away. He just kept inching forward. Do you know what was his motivation? It wasn't suffering. It's what his suffering would alleviate us from. Jesus knew that if he would go to the cross, if he would shed his blood, if he would die on that cross for our sins, that we would never have to. And in the moment of his suffering, imagine the craziness of this, he, he gives thanks for the possibility 
that there will be many who come to salvation, who receive the four promises because of what his actions would do. Here is the critical question for us to ask if we're facing something that has clouded our vision. What is God's plan in this? What good could God bring in the midst of my suffering if I will just look to him, if I will just see with his eyes, if I will imagine what it is that God is doing through the circumstances and through the details and through the conversations and through the hard times and through the good times, if we'll focus on the eternal then the temporary, even if it's painful, will only be temporary. And God will complete the good thing that he started. I remember when I was in fifth grade, um, I had a nightmare and I'll never, I, I don't remember a lot of my dreams, I definitely don't remember a lot of my nightmares, but I will never forget this nightmare. I was in fifth grade, and I dreamed that my dad died. So it was just one of those random weird dreams, right? And um, I don't know if God gave it to me, or if he was trying to prepare me. Eventually my, would, my dad would go on and pass away at a, at a young age, prematurely. Uh, but I remember waking up, and my pillow was just, was, <laughs> was totally soaked. And I was so scared in my heart. My heart was so full of fear that it was actually true. Uh, even though I saw the tears, I thought maybe I was, I was dreaming about something that happened. And I ran up to my parents' room. It was like 2 a.m. And I literally, I jumped on top of my dad's sleeping body, right? He was totally alive. And, and, and I shook him and I said, Dad, are you real? And he just kind of opened up his eyes and he said, Jordan, what are you doing? You know? And and I'll never forget that moment because I just like, I just, that fear was totally alleviated as my head just rested in his chest. And I, I could hear his heart beating and I could feel his warmth. And that, that gave me the, the strength to go back downstairs and go back to sleep. And, you know, the reality is most of us have not thought about the scenarios that could be in a temporary earth in temporary lives in temporary circumstances we probably put too much security in earthly things that god never promises will never change uh i'm not trying to be debbie downer i'm actually trying to help you see an anchor that is embedded in a situation and in our life, and in our circumstances, that can never be taken from you. Because here's the reality. People and things can be. And and I don't believe that God wants people to die or wants people to get sick, and that's a whole other sermon on on theology of what God desires for us. But God can take really bad circumstances and remind us of some eternal things that can never be taken taken from us. So I, I actually want to, I want to ask the question today. I don't ask this kind of question a lot, but I think it's helpful. What if everything in our life is taken from us? Here's the crazy thing. I actually believe that the way for any pessimist to become an optimist is to become the ultimate pessimist. I'm going to tell you what I mean. I want you to turn with me uh, in your Bibles to uh, Psalm 136. So we're going to read through verse 9 for for our tech room, through verse 9, then we're going to skip to 26. I'm going to say the first part, you're going to say the second part. Even if you don't have a Bible, it'd be easy to remember this. Uh, Your part is this, for his steadfast love endures forever. It's in yellow up on the screens. Whatever I say before that, that's what you'll respond with. This is Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him alone does great wonders. To him uh, who by understanding made the heavens. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. The sun to rule over the day. 
the moon and the stars to rule over the night. And what you see in verses 10 all the way through the rest of this chapter is, is the, the biography of Israel and all of the things that God does. And it says this in verse 26, Give thanks to the God of heaven. And you're tempted when you read that to think that you're praising God for only the things that He does because you've got this timeline of just awe-inspiring power of God intervening for His people, and yet it says so clearly that we're giving thanks for His steadfast love endures forever. We can work on our memorization skills a little bit. For His steadfast love endures forever. What I've discovered about this life is that Everything is temporary. But that God's steadfast love endures forever. So I actually, I'm going to invite you to go down that deep, dark rabbit hole because I believe that the way for any pessimist to become an optimist is to become the ultimate pessimist. And I, I'm using secular terms. How do you move from fear to faith? That's the biblical journey. Just go there. What is the worst possible thing that can happen to you. Close your eyes and just imagine it just for a moment. I'm not going to, I don't want you to dwell on it, but what's the worst thing? What's the worst possible thing that can happen to you? Okay, in that moment, I want you to ask this question. What do I still have? What can never be taken from me? I'm going to give you a hint. It's connected to Psalm 136. His steadfast love endures forever. If you want proof, just turn with me into the New Testament. I want to read you one of those verses that has anchored me. It's found in Romans chapter 8. It is talking about God's unconditional and sacrificial love. It says this in verse 35. And by the way, all of the New Testament is written to physically persecuted Christians. So again, I'm not trying to be mean to us and our experience or make us feel like our pain isn't worthwhile, but just, just it helps to bring context. All of the people who are hearing this have lost loved, one, loved ones or, or have potentially been physically persecuted. Nero was so sick and sadistic, he would, he would literally, if they didn't pledge allegiance to him, he'd stick their body in a pole, pour tar on them, and light them on fire and bring a whole new application to being the light of the world. That was a real, very real possibility. So when we read the New Testament, we just don't think about like the physical persecution. I don't, I, I don't want to minimize our pain. I just want to remind us that if it's true for those people, who, by the way, are all around us in the world that we live in today because there have been more martyrs in the last 100 years than the previous 2,000 years combined, there are places in the world that are so hostile to Christianity, you cannot be public about your faith unless it's a death sentence. And this is what the author of Romans says. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, again, think about the kinds of distress, he's going to go on to explain, or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. His faithful love endures forever unchanging circumstances unchanging love for i'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of god in christ jesus our lord you see what i've discovered as a realist is that you can go to that dark end but here's the reality for a Christian. You're not there alone. Jesus went before you. He went there. There's nothing that you can imagine that Jesus or someone in Scripture who placed their trust in God has not experienced to know that God is bigger than our circumstances. Even though His timeline doesn't always match up our timeline, He's good. He is good. He is good. You can place your trust in Him. 
It's like the anchor. It's like the true north. It's like the thing that just keeps everything from falling apart. If I know nothing else, everything can be taken from me, but I know God is good, and he is with me. He's gone before me, and I can place my trust in him. He went to the cross so that I don't have to. That's unconditional and sacrificial agape love, and that's what Jesus has for you. And that's something to be thankful for. But most of the time, we don't think about salvation or what God has done as being the foundation for why we give thanks. We, we thank God for all the things we talked about last week, which are good and are from him, like the sunlight hitting my toes. <laughs> I want to go back and listen to that one. It was good. But we forget, like this, there is a, a much deeper truth in all of this that is interweaving our pain with Christ's pain and giving us meaning and purpose by which gets us out, out of bed for another day. Giving thanks focuses our attention on the good and on God. Would you stand with me today? Maybe you've never placed your trust in Christ. You don't know what it looks like to be thankful for salvation because you, you've never experienced God saving you. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. If that's you today, I invite you to say this prayer with me. I'm going to invite you to say this prayer with our whole congregation as I invite our whole congregation just to lift our hands as we prepare to praise God for what he has done. All across this room, I just invite you to lift your hands. And if you've never prayed this prayer or need to pray this prayer again to recommit your heart to God, just say it in your own heart and mean it. And just mean it. That's it. Every, with every eye uh, closed and every head bowed. Father, we admit that we need a fresh start. We have not trusted you. We have not believed that you are good even in the midst of really hard times. But we do believe that Jesus died on the cross to defeat sin, to defeat sickness, and even death in my life. And because of his promise, I will be forgiven and I am forgiven today. I commit my whole heart, my whole heart, my whole future, my whole body, my whole marriage, my whole family, all of my finances, I commit myself to you. God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me.